Well, hey, welcome to Center Church. My name is Josh Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest with us here today, or if this is your second or third time, welcome. Man, we are really, really glad that you're here. Lots of new people coming around, and we are really, really grateful for that. Um, Let me tell you what kind of church we want to be, okay? This is kind of an image of what we aspire to be. We want to be the kind of church, man, where you grow in your faith. That after being here for a year, you say, man, I, I know God more. I'm walking more closely with Jesus than I was. We also want to be a place where you build meaningful relationships. And you say, man, my people are here, the people that really know what's going on with me, that pray for me, that support me, that walk with me in my marriage. And as a parent, man, those relationships, man, are at this church. I've built those here. Uh, Finally, we want to be a place where you make a difference, where you say, man, I I figured out what my gifts are and where God has placed me. And I I feel inspired and equipped to make a difference in my community and around the world. Okay. That is what we are trying to be as a church. Let me tell you what we're not trying to be. Ready? We're not trying to be a place where a bunch of people who don't know each other come together on Sunday, sing some songs, listen to a talk from me, and then go home unchanged. (laughs) Okay, that's not what we want to be. But if we're honest, that's what a lot of churches become, right? So here's what I'm telling you all this. The the practical difference between what we want to be and what we don't want to be is an event here that we call the Weekender. Okay, the Weekender is our one-stop shop for connection. It is your inroad and on-ramp to discipleship and growth at our church. Man, it's, it's where you learn about what we believe. It's where you start to build those relationships who become your people. And it's how you learn, man, how can I connect my life and my gifts and my abilities to what God is doing here in Charlottesville and around the world, okay? So if, if you're new or you wanna get more connected, I wanna invite you to join us for the Weekender. Our next one is coming up this Friday and Saturday, February 3rd. And fifth, we want to get to know you. We want to share a little bit about who we are as a church, our beliefs and our values. We want to help you start forming relationships and just figure out what is your right next step, okay? So, man, whether you're, you're an empty nester who's checking things out, whether you're a family with kids, whether you're a college student, whoever you are, man, if, if you want to get more connected and if you want to kind of connect into the life of this church, the Weekender is how you do that, and I would love to have you join us, okay? Zach is going to give you more details about registration, RCP, and child care and all that at the end of the service. But what I want to do is I just want to stop and pray and ask God to help us become the kind of church that we really believe he wants us to be. Okay, so would you pray with me? Lord God, um, I think about your word in 2 in second, in second Peter chapter 3 that, that says, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of church we want to be, God. We want to be the kind of place where men and women and, and retirees and students, everybody in between and kids are growing in grace and are growing in knowledge and are becoming more like you, are forming meaningful relationships, are making a difference in this world. So God, would you help us to be that kind of place? Would you help us to, to lead in that kind of way? Would you give people courage to take next steps of connection? And God, as we look at your word here in Proverbs 27, would you inform us and would you shape us that we'd become more like your son? We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can open up to Proverbs chapter 27, starting in verse 23. Proverbs 27, starting in verse 23, that's where we're going to be today. Uh, We are in the final week of a series that we've been calling Wisdom for Everyday Life. Wisdom for Everyday Life. And the big idea of this series is that as the creator, God has a design for every area of our lives. And when we live according to that design, we experience his blessing. And when we deviate from that design, we experience brokenness. So we've been looking at the book of Proverbs to learn God's design for different practical areas of our lives. So we've talked about wisdom in general. We talked about sex and marriage. We talked about friendship. And today we're gonna finish by talking about money. There are more important things in life than money, but that's not to say money isn't important. There are more important things in life than money, but that's not to say money isn't important. Think about it. Money impacted almost everything about you today. Right? Money determines what you're wearing. It determines what you drove here. It determines the kind of food you eat and whether you prepare it or someone else prepares it for you, right? It determines the schooling options that you have for your kids. It determines uh, if you travel, where you travel, and what you do when you travel, right? I mean, just if we're honest with ourselves, money does matter. It makes a massive impact on our lives kind of externally and practically. Um, But beyond that, money also impacts us internally or spiritually, if you will. So studies have found that one of the leading causes of anxiety is money. And one of the leading causes of marital conflict is money. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's something about money and what we do with our money that impacts us at the deepest level. So here's what all of this means. If we want to be fully formed followers of Jesus, if we, if we want to be more like him in every area of our lives, man, then we have to answer the question, what is God's design for money? What does God say about this massive area in my life that has so many implications? And Proverbs 27 is going to help us answer that question. 
Because in it, King Solomon is going to give divinely inspired financial advice to his son. Okay, that's what's happening in Proverbs 27. It's King Solomon giving divinely inspired financial advice to his son. And by studying this text, we're going to learn three things that a wise person does with their resources. Three things that a wise person does with their resources. Here is number one. A wise person pays attention to their resources. A wise person pays attention to their resources. Here's verse 23. Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. Now, all of you farmers are like, fantastic, applies directly to me, right? And then everybody else is like, well, Josh, I don't have any flocks, I don't have any herds, so I guess this doesn't apply to me, but it actually does. You see, this is a metaphor. In fact, it was a metaphor when Solomon said it. His son wasn't a farmer, okay? His son was a prince. So, so Solomon is using this as a metaphor to instruct us about wisdom when it comes to finances. You see, back in the day, you didn't have a retirement account, you had a herd of goats, okay? That's what you had. It was like, you're investing into your herd of goats and you hope that when you retire, it will support you. And so anytime in this verse that you see, man, herd, know, know well the condition of your flocks or the condition of your herd, Solomon is talking about your resources, okay? He's simply talking about the financial resources that God has entrusted to you. Solomon says, know well the condition of, when he says, know well the conditions of your flocks, he's saying, know well the condition of your finances. And he says, know well, all right? A little bit of an English lesson, all right? Let's go back to school. No is a verb, right? Well is an adverb. An adverb modifies the verb. And so here's what Solomon is saying. Don't just have a general vague idea of what's going on with your flocks. Be very, very aware of what is going on with your flocks, Right? And to translate to us, don't just be generally vaguely aware of, of your finances. Like, I think I have enough. I think more is coming in that's going out. Man, be very aware. Know what's coming in. Know what's going out. Know what expenses are on the horizon. Know what investments you're making and how you're planning for the future. You see, a wise farmer is very aware of the condition of his flocks, and a wise person is very aware of the condition of his resources. Man, a wise person, man, makes a budget, checks the budget, and sticks to the budget. Okay, so if, if you're here and you're like I was for a long time, you don't have a budget. You're just like, it's all working out. Make a budget. That's your application, okay, from, from this sermon today. Because here's what we know. What we pay attention to tends to flourish, doesn't it? When does your physical health go well? When you pay attention to it. When does your spiritual life go well? When you pay attention to it. When does your marriage go well? When you pay attention to it. Well, the same thing is true in your financial life. Man, when you pay attention to your financial life and you, you know the resources that God has given you, they tend to do well. Health is always born from intentionality. Health is always born from intentionality. So Solomon is simply saying to his son and to us today, hey, a wise person pays attention to what they have. A wise person pays close attention to their resources. And now in verse 24 through 27, Solomon is going to give us one of the reasons why that matters. Here we go, verse 24. For riches do not last forever, and does a crown endure to all generations? When the grass is gone, and the new growth appears, and the vegetation of the mountains is gathered, then the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats the price of a field. There will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and maintenance for your girls." All right, you see that word for at the beginning of verse 24. You could always tra also translate that because. Solomon is saying, pay attention to the condition of your flocks because riches don't last forever. And then in verse 25, he starts talking about how seasons change. Did you notice that? Here's a summary of verse 25. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. What happens in the winter? The grass is all gone. You see that? The new vegetation is not yet ready to be harvested. Man, and all of the fruit from the fields has been gathered in. Okay, when that time came, a, war, a wise farmer depended on his herds for his food. His family couldn't eat apples or harvest wheat, man, but they could eat milk and cheese that their herds provided. The herds got them through to the spring. So what does this mean for us today? Man, it means winter is coming. Winter is coming. Winter for us doesn't look like snow. It doesn't look like, you know, the, the harvest not being ready. You know what it looks like? I mean, it looks like a housing crash. It looks like rising inflation. It looks like unexpected medical bills. Man, major car repairs, losing your job, a recession economy, a bear market. It looks like anything that squeezes you financially. Solomon is saying, look, if you pay close attention to your resources, then when winter comes, you will have enough. Or put another way, if you take care of your resources, then your resources will take care of you. If you take care of your resources, then your resources will take care of you. Now, that, maybe that really resonates with you. Maybe you're like, yes, amen, I've seen that in my life. Or maybe that's kind of challenging to you, right? The idea that like there's some sort of connection between what I do and, and what I have. 
And if, if you're listening critically, here's what I hope you're realizing. This is a very countercultural statement. Because the Bible is saying there is a direct link between what you do and what you end up having. I mean, that's what, that's what Solomon is saying. And, and if you got out in the world, if you said that in a lot of places around our community, like that, would, people would gasp at that concept, right? That is very, very offensive because our world today often says, no, 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 that's not the case. There are economic forces beyond my control that are pushing me down. I'll never get ahead. I'll always struggle because of the system or my background or my family of origin. Now, does your upbringing impact you? 100% it does. Does generational wealth provide more opportunities for some people than other people? Sure. We aren't all dealt the same hand, but that doesn't mean you can't play the hand you're dealt. Right? We aren't all dealt the same hand, 100% concede that, but that doesn't mean you can't play the hand you're dealt. Imagine with me a family who has one lamb. And the family says, we've only, we've only got this one lamb. That's all we got. That's all we're ever going to have. Look at all our neighbors. They got all these lambs. Man, they were born with these lambs. They went to lamb school. They've got better lamb land. All right, like they're, they're always gonna, uh, we're never gonna get ahead. We've got this one puny lamb. So here's what we should do. Let's just, let's slaughter this lamb, eat it, have a party and just resign ourselves to struggle. We're never gonna get ahead, okay? Now imagine another family with one lamb. And they say, man, we only have this one lamb. So we better take care of this lamb. Man, we're going to feed him. We're going to brush him. We're going to walk him around town. I mean, this is going to be the best cared for lamb you have ever met. He's sleeping in the bed, all right? Like, your kids can't sleep there, but your lamb can, all right? Like, this is going to be the best cared for lamb in town. Then one day, we're going to shear this lamb, and we're going to take that wool to market, and we're going to sell it, and we're going to use that to buy another lamb. And now I've got two lambs. Now, that other family down the street, that other family has 200 lambs. And, and they were born with 200 lambs. And they're probably always going to have more lambs than I have, but I'm not worried about their lambs. I'm not worried about what they have. I'm worried about what I have. Because, guys, the fundamental point of this passage is pay attention to your flocks and pay attention to your herds. And whatever God has entrusted to you, nurture and manage it, whether it is two, 20, 200, or 200,000 lambs. And if you do, then you can have a reasonable expectation that you will have enough. Now, is it possible that something happens that severs the link between what you do and what you have? 100% that's possible. We live in a broken world, and so sometimes things happen that break the link. This is a proverb. It is not a promise. But that shouldn't keep us from leaning into God's design for money. Because more often than not, if you take care of your resources, your resources will take care of you. And that's the first thing that Solomon wants us to understand from this passage, that a wise person pays attention to their resources. Now, one more thing I want us to notice before we move on to point number two is that word enough. Do you see that word enough in verse 27? That if, if you do this, you can have reasonable expectation that you and your family will have enough. Right? Jesus repeated that same truth in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 31. He said this, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. That's people who don't know God. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. Isn't that good news? He knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, what are all, the, all these things that Jesus is referring to? Is he referring to cash and prizes? He seems to be referring to kind of the basics of life, man. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Guys, God promises to provide for our needs. He doesn't pr promise to provide for our wants. He promises to provide enough. He doesn't promise to provide abundance. We often become discontent with enough because we feel entitled to abundance. We often feel discontent with what we have because we don't have what we want. But friends, I don't know how to say it. God has never promised to give me what I want. <laughs> God has promised that, man, if I walk faithfully in him, more often than not, then I'm going to have enough. But that doesn't mean I'm going to have abundance. I think often, especially in our culture, we tend to believe that contentment is on the other side of the next purchase or the next upgrade. And the stage of life you're in depends a lot on what you think the next upgrade is, right? So, you know, like if you're in college, the next upgrade might be like a new Patagonia jacket, right? It might be that spring break trip that all your friends are getting to do. If you're a young adult, the next upgrade might be, man, being able to travel to Nashville, Man, and be able to go to Portland and be able to go to and have all these experiences that you, that you want to have. If, if you're newly married, the upgrade might be buying that first house, right? If, if, if you know, you're a little bit more established, it's like, man, I want to get that forever home. 
You know, like I want to get the quartz, you know, countertops and I want to have, you know, like the, the hardy plank paneling and, and all this stuff, right? If, if you're retired, it might be, hey, I want to be able to, man, live comfortably. I want to be able to travel as much as I want to. I want to be able to live near my grandkids, right? And none of those things are, are bad things in themselves, but it's bad when we think that they're going to give us contentment. Because isn't this true? Isn't it true that no matter what you get, it never finally and fully satisfies you? I mean, many of you who, who have lived longer than me can testify to that. You got the first house and then you got the forever home and then you, you, you got the raise and you got the 401k and you retired and everything's, and it's just, it just doesn't satisfy us. And the reason it doesn't satisfy us is content, contentment cannot be obtained through accumulation. It can only be learned through discipleship. Contentment cannot be obtained through accumulation. It can only be learned through discipleship. In Philippians 4 verse 12, Paul wrote this, for I have learned, is that interesting language? I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul wasn't content because he had everything he wanted. He was content because in Christ, he learned to be satisfied. When we find our satisfaction in Christ, when he is our source of, source of joy, when he is our source of significance, it frees us from needing abundance and it enables us to be deeply grateful and satisfied with enough, with enough. So point number one, a wise person pays attention to their resources and when you take care of your resources, more often than not, your resources will take care of you. Okay, here's number two. A wise person trusts God as their refuge. A wise person trusts God as their refuge. This is going to be a shorter point, but I think it's important to say. You see, some people don't pay enough attention to their money. Their temptation is to be negligent of their resources. Other people pay a lot of attention to their money, and their temptation is to trust in their resources as a refuge. And these two people usually get married to one another. Okay, that's how that works. But guys, here's what the scriptures are saying. Here's what Proverbs 27 is saying. A wise person pays attention to their resources, but trusts in God as their refuge. Look back at verse 24 with me. For riches do not last forever and does a crown endure to all generations. Here's what, Proverbs, what Solomon is saying. And Solomon was a very wealthy man. He's saying riches don't last. They don't endure. They can't be your refuge. I love what Proverbs 23, 5 says in the KJV. It says, money can grow wings like a bird and fly away. Right? And if you've lived long enough, you're like, I know that's true, right? Like, I know that's true. I mean, maybe it was, you know, the housing crash in 07. Like, my, my parents lost hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity like that. Man, they did all the right things, you know, like they, they had the 20% down, they were paying it over time. And what was the plan? Man, we're going to pay this down, we're going to sell this house, it's going to help us retirement. Overnight, lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. Was that their fault? I don't know. It's just, it's just life. Maybe you lost a small business during COVID. Right? I, I, I have some friends who are in sales, and they're like, man, my commission went down 70% in 2020. Because right? people just weren't buying anything, right? I was like trying to, trying to figure it out. Man, he, here's, here's what this text is telling us. No amount of money can make you safe. No level of income can provide you a refuge from the storms of life. I mean, I could just give you example after example of extraordinarily wealthy people who could not be saved by their money. Think about Steve Jobs. No matter how much money Steve Jobs had, it didn't matter when the doctor said pancreatic cancer. Right? There, there's not a dollar amount that you can achieve that you can have in one of your multiple savings accounts man, that can be a true refuge for you in life. Right? The only true refuge in life is the Lord. So I want you to pay attention to your resources. I do. And if you don't have a budget, I want you to make one. I want you to have a plan and I want you to grow your resources and I want all the best for you. But don't let that dupe you into thinking that your money can be your refuge because it can't. Whenever we're talking about money, I think it's always really important to remember that God stands behind it all. Just think about the metaphor that Solomon is using in Proverbs 27. He says, there's a part we play and then there's a part that God plays. A wise farmer takes care of his flock, okay? That's our job. Take care of your resources. But let me ask you a question. What if spring never comes? It does not matter how well the farmer takes care of his flocks. If spring never comes, they're all going to die. It does not matter how well the, the farmer takes care of his flocks. If the water doesn't come, that, that, that nourishes the ground, that causes the grass to grow for his flocks to eat. 
And who is it that causes winter to flip over into spring? And who is it that causes the rains to come? And it's not me, it's the Lord. And so as we pursue our resources, as we take care of them and we try to invest them well, and we try to take care of them well, and we try to be responsible, we need to remember that behind it all is a God who is gracious and who has provided us so many good things and we should make him our refuge, not our savings account. Right, I love how King David put this, a very wealthy man. I mean, if there's anybody that could trust in his wealth, it was King David. And this is what he said in Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies. So a wise person pays attention to their resources, but trusts in God as their refuge. Here's the third thing we learn. Number three, a wise person lives as a steward and not as an owner. A wise person lives as a steward and not as an owner. Now, to fully understand the significance of this proverb, of Proverb 27, we need to place it in its total biblical context, okay? So we're going to need to zoom out just a little bit and do what people call biblical theology. So biblical theology is simply, what does the Bible teach about the subject? So we're going to do some biblical theology of money. All right, so we're going to ask the question, what does the Bible teach about money? And then that will help us to better understand this proverb in its context, okay? So let's start by by talking about what the Bible doesn't teach about money, all right? First, it does not teach poverty theology. It does not teach poverty theology. Poverty theology says money is inherently evil. And as such, the less money you have, the holier you are. So like a real formal expression of this would be a vow of poverty that someone might take. Hey, money is evil, so if I have any of it, it's going to make me evil, and so I'm just not going to, I'm going to have as little of it as I possibly can. But the Bible just doesn't support that theology. In 1 Timothy 6, the Apostle Paul spoke directly to rich people, and this is what he said. He charged the rich to trust in God, to be generous and ready to share. But he didn't say, get rid of your money because it's inherently evil, take a, a vow of poverty. And then as you look throughout the scriptures, there are just multiple examples of very wealthy men and women who are held up as models of faithfulness. Okay, so Abraham, Joseph, Job, David. Fast forward into the New Testament. You've got uh, Joanna and Susa who both supported Jesus's ministry financially. You've got Barnabas. Man, you've got John Mark and, and his family who hosted the church in the city of Jerusalem. You've got Lydia who was a business owner who hosted the, the church in Philippi in her large home. Right? So, so the Bible simply does not teach poverty theology that, that money is inherently bad, and so the less of it you have, the holier you are. On the flip side, the Bible also does not teach prosperity theology. So prosperity theology says the more money you have, the holier you are. Right? If you're a person of great faith, if you're a person of great righteousness, then God will bless you with cash and prizes. But the Bible simply doesn't teach that idea either. In fact, the scriptures constantly warn against the danger of loving money. Jesus Jesus said that it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God because they'll be very tempted to trust in their money more than Christ. Paul, in that same letter to Timothy, in, 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 uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy chapter 5, said, the love of money has led many to wander from the, the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. Right, so the Bible does warn us about money, about loving money, about putting our hope in money. So it wouldn't make sense if it's like, hey, the holier you are, I'll give you more of this stuff that you're gonna try to trust in. On top of that, I mean, Jesus, all of the apostles, most of the early church were blue-collar, working-class people. They, they didn't have a lot of money. And if there's anybody that I think we want to say was holy and full of faith, I think it's that group. <laughs> okay, and so the Bible simply does not support prosperity theology. So it's not poverty theology. It's not prosperity theology. So what does the Bible teach about money? The Bible teaches what's called stewardship theology. Stewardship theology says this, everything belongs to God. Everything you have, let me press on you, everything you have, any bank account, any physical asset, any gift, any amount of time, any networked opportunity, any relationship, everything that you have, everything that I have belongs to God. The only reason we have it is because he's entrusted it to us. Psalm 24.1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. That is an all-encompassing verse. I mean, if if you and your resources fit into uh, the world and everyone that dwells in it and uh, and, and the fullness of it, then you belong to God. Your stuff belongs to God. Let me tell you, 
whether you agree with that or not, right? Like, it doesn't matter if I agree with that. It doesn't matter if I'm like, no, I want that to be true. God's just saying, no, it, it's mine. <laughs> like, like it's, it's mine whether you want it to be or not. Okay, so principle number one, everything belongs to God, and he's entrusted us with his resources. So what are we supposed to do with those resources? Well, the scriptures tell us we're supposed to work as stewards of those resources. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a story of a man, a master, a very wealthy man, who went away on a long journey, and he called three of his servants, and he entrusted them with very amounts of his property. And he said, hey, I want you to use this property for my purposes, and then when I come back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you to account. So sure enough, he leaves, and you know, the three servants go off, and, and two of them use their resources well. One of them doesn't use their, his resources well. Many, many days later, the, the master comes back, and he calls them to account. And he says, how did you use my resources? And the first two used them well, and they were rewarded, and they were, man, uh, rewarded to the degree that they were faithful. The third servant came and did not use his master's resources well. And he, he wasn't just patted on the back and be like, hey, better luck next time. He was called wait, lazy and wicked and he was cast out of the household. Jesus finished just telling that story and then he looks at his disciples and he looks at us today and he says, that's what the kingdom of God is like. Whoa. He says, God is like the rich man who owns everything and we are like his servants and he's entrusted us with varying degrees of resources. You know, some five talents, some three talents, some one talent. And, and there's going to come a day when, when we are going to stand before him and we are going to give an account for how we used his resources. We are going to stand before God in judgment. And if we manage them well, we're going to be rewarded. And if we haven't managed them well, we're going to be rebuked. Now, when I say that, this might be the question that comes, that comes to your head. Wait a minute. I thought being a Christian saved me from the judgment of God. Is that what you're always saying, Josh? Is that what you say every single sermon? Friend, being a Christian saves you from the wrath of God, but being a Christian does not save you from the judgment of God. These are actually two distinct theological categories that are really helpful to understand. In fact, my wife is the one who kind of helped me, helped me get this. The wrath of God is his retributive justice against sin. And if you are in Christ, then all of God's wrath against your sin was poured out on Jesus 2,000 years ago on Calvary. Praise God. That if you are in Christ, when you stand before God on that final day, he will not pour out any wrath upon you because it has already been poured out on Jesus. Jesus drained the cup to the very bottom. He turned it over and yelled out, it is finished to tell us I. The good news of the gospel is that if you were in Christ, John 3.36 says that the wrath of God no longer abides upon you. But that is different than the judgment of God. The scriptures clearly teach, I mean, just read through the New Testament, that every Christian will stand before God in judgment and give an account for their life. 2 Corinthians 5, chapter uh, 5, 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Who's Paul talking to there? He's talking to Christians, talking to the church in Corinth. So if you are a Christian, you are saved from the wrath of God. Hallelujah. But you will face the judgment of God. And at first I know that kind of seems heavy, right? That like seems like bad news, but it's actually good news because it means everything in your life matters. Everything in your life matters. How you treat your roommate matters. How you teach your students in first grade matters. Man, how you invest in your kids that no one will ever see matters. Man, how you care for your patients at the hospital, that matters. Man, how you serve the people in your missional community and you, man, you bring people meals matters. Man, how you serve the needy matters. How you pursue sexual purity matters. How you engage in your studies, that matters. Man, how you honor your parents, how you love your spouse, how you raise your kids, how you invest your money, all of it matters. The judgment of God means every moment of your life is shot through with meaning and significance. That there is no purposeless moment of your entire life. And that's good news. In Matthew chapter 24, um, the disciples are asking Jesus, hey, Jesus, what's the end of the world going to be like? Don't you love the disciples? They're just always asking, they're like, Jesus, what's the end of the world going to be like? Um, and so he's trying to, you know, he's explaining it to him and he's using all these metaphors. Um, but then he starts talking in verse 30 about what it's going to be like when he returns. And this is kind of, it's crazy to read, okay? But just so you know, if you're a Christian here, and I know not everybody's a Christian here, but if you're a Christian here, like, this is what you believe, okay? So like, newsflash, this is what you believe is going to happen. Verse 30 of Matthew 24, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, that's Jesus, 
And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Those are people who have rejected him, who have not bowed down to his lordship and received him as savior. They will mourn. And they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect, that is his people, those who believed in him, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What the scriptures teach is that Jesus came the first time in great humility, but he's coming the second time in great power and great glory. And his coming will be the cause of rejoicing for some and will be the cause of great mourning for others. And on that day, every single one of us 2 Corinthians 5 will stand before him in judgment. Now get that image in your mind. Like that's what's com- that's that's the end. That's what's coming. And then you ask the question, how should I live my life in light of that reality? And here's what Proverbs 27 is saying. A wise person lives as a steward, not as an owner. A wise person treats their entire life as a gift from God to be managed for his purposes. A wise person is motivated by the grace of God, by a desire to reach the lost, by a desire to strengthen the church, and by a desire to be found faithful on that final day. And a wise person leverages all of their life, all of it, for God's glory. And friends, you can only do that. You can only be a faithful steward if you pay close attention to your resources. That's the tie-in to Proverbs 27. There's no such thing as being a good steward who doesn't know what they have. There's no such thing as being a good steward with like a vague idea of like, oh yeah, like I kind of give a little bit to the church and like I kind of use my time well, but I don't really think about it that much. That's the opposite of what a good steward is. A good steward knows exactly what's going on, exactly what they've been trusted with, man, how it, how's it going, where it needs to be invested, what we could do better with it. So we should pay close attention to our resources and we should use them for God's glory so that on that final day, we will be found faithful. Right? That, that's what I would say is kind of the big theological point of Proverbs 27. There's the practical application for like your own budget, but then you got to zoom out and you got to see it, man, in, in the sweeping nature of biblical theology, man, of just how much your life matters. It matters. So the question is, if that's true, man, how do we start living as faithful stewards? Well, there's a lot of answers to that, but let me give you two points of application that you can kind of walk away with. Letter A, walk in wisdom by creating margin. Walk in wisdom by creating margin. Here's the reality. Many of us don't invest our lives, our time, our talent, our treasure for the kingdom of God because we simply have no margin to do so. We're so maxed out in so many other areas of life that we never get around to investing in the kingdom. But listen to Proverbs 21, verse 20. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. Now, why would there be treasure and oil in a wise man's dwelling, but not in a foolish man's dwelling? Well, because the foolish man spends all of his treasure and uses all of his oil. That's what the, he devours it. He has no margin. He uses absolutely everything that he has. But a wise man has margin. A wise man doesn't use all the treasure. A wise man doesn't use up all the oil. The foolish man has nothing to put into a savings account. He has nothing to invest. He has nothing to give to the kingdom of God because he has devoured all of it with his lifestyle. Man, but a wise man has margin and invests that for the glory of God. So here's the question. Do you have margin? Do you have margin in your life? Do you have something each month that you can save, that you can invest, and that you can give away? If not, you're just not going to be able to live out Proverbs 27. You may desire to, but if you don't have any margin, you're not going to be able to. And when it it comes to margin, here's what I think we we tend to believe. We tend to believe uh, that we have an income problem, don't we? Like if I I made more money, then I'd have margin. But But more often than not, what we have is a lifestyle problem. It's not an income problem. It's a lifestyle problem. The choices I'm making are devouring my margin. Let me give you a personal example of this. Uh, We have an unfinished part of our basement. And so about a year ago, we we said, hey, let's let's finish that. We can put it in a bedroom and a bathroom. It'd be a great place for my parents to stay, people to come over, the whole thing. So we, we, start, we start working on um, the basement, and as you probably know, it costs money to finish a basement, right? So we're working on the whole thing. And a couple of months in, we're like having our budget meeting, and Meredith and I are like both really frustrated. We're just like, it's not working. There's all these expenses. We're busting our, blah, blah, blah. And we were just like, I, I think one of us said like, we can't afford our life. And then in that moment, we both realized, no, we can afford our life. We just can't afford our lifestyle. We don't need to finish the basement. Like there's no, we've been fine with an unfinished basement, right? Like we don't need to finish the basement. We just want to finish the basement. 
And so what we need to do is we need to pause because we don't have the resources to do it right now. So we stopped finishing the basement and all of a sudden the budget worked, right? We didn't, we didn't have an income problem. We had a lifestyle problem. And I wonder if, if you could resonate with that. I wonder if there's, where, there's some things that you'd like to be doing, whether it's saving or giving more generously or giving it all, that you'd say, man, I'll do that when I make more money. Like, I'll do that when, you know, my salary gets bumped up or, like, commissions increase or, like, you know, whatever. I get it, even get out of school. Like, I just make a little bit now. I don't need to worry about that now. Right? But, but the truth is, man, the, the patterns that we start when we don't have a lot of, the patterns will continue when we gain more. Jesus said, he who is faithful with little can be entrusted with much. And so the question is, do you have margin? And margin usually comes down to the choices we make in four big areas. All right, here are the areas. Where I live, what I drive, where we eat, and what activities we do. Isn't that true? I mean, isn't that like most of my budget and your budget? Like, can I just be really straightforward with you? If your mortgage is 65% of your take-home pay, that ain't going to work, right? Like, it's just not. And some of you, if that's true, you're like, yep, it's not working. You know, like, it's, it's not working. If, if you've got a $400 car payment or $300, $200, like, there goes your margin. You know, it's like, that could be $400 a margin. Like, buy the 08 Accord and put oil in it, all right? It's going to be great. Right? If, if you've got, I'm just trying to be really honest here. If you've got like a $10,000 vacation planned and yet you're not saving at all, you're not investing in the kingdom of God at all, you probably need to just go for a weekend and not a week. Because here's what we do. We're like, God, well, I would do what you say if you'd give me enough money. And God's like, what do you think all this is? You keep spending it at the Outer Banks. You know, like, I love the Outer Banks. Like, you can go to the Outer Banks. I'm just saying, like, like, we have to be honest with ourselves. And I think oftentimes we, we deflect and we act like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'll start living according to God's design and money when he gives me more. And God's like, I'd love to see you do it right now with what I've given you. And then maybe I'll entrust you with more. So the first thing that a wise person does is they make hard decisions to create margin in their life. I heard a great story about this that I was really inspired by. So pastor I, I respect a lot uh, who, when he and his wife were like in their mid-20s, they wanted to plant a church. But they had a lot of debt. And it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't, it was like student debt, like very typical student debt. And they're like, man, I don't know if we can plant a church until, you know, we, we deal with this. And his brother-in-law was a real godly guy. And he sat him down over Christmas and he looked him in the eyes and he said, I want to challenge you as a man to pay off all your debt this year. Believe God, make the sacrifices, pay off that debt so you don't put your family in a bad situation when you go to plant a church. And he was like, whoa, like that. But he took it to heart. And so he, he and his wife, the whole next year, man, they just made pretty some serious changes and they paid off all their student debt in a year. And then they were able to go and plant a church that reached a whole bunch of people and they weren't under constant financial pressure, man, because they had made some hard, wise choices, man, to kind of live their life according to God's design. So I don't know what it is for you. Maybe this is like super overwhelming. I get that. But do you have any margin in your life that, man, that you can invest, that you can save and that you can give? If not, man, a, a wise person creates margin. That's letter A. Here's letter B. A wise person gives generously. A wise person... I'm sorry, walk in wisdom by giving generously. All right, Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. So that means give to him what already belongs to him. Give your first and your best to the Lord. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Did you notice how unapologetically cause and effect that verse is? Almost makes you a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? Like, Josh, you can about start telling me, like, you know, like, prosperity stuff. Like, well, I don't know what else to do with this verse. I'm going to be like, it seems to be saying, if you honor God and, and give your first and your best to him of your time, of your talent, of your treasure, all of it, man, then he looks kindly on your situation and blesses you. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if that's going to mean, you know, cash and prizes, but th that seems to be what Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 is saying. And, guys, this gets back to the core theological concept of the whole sermon. Man, that we are stewards, we are not owners. And one of the primary ways that we declare that God is our provider, God is our refuge, and God is our joy is by investing our money in his kingdom. Or more, more, maybe more accurately, by investing his money in his kingdom. And Proverbs 3 tells us when we do that, God is honored, his kingdom advances, and he promises to provide for us. Now, if it bothers you that I'm talking about this, and it might, like maybe you've got a bad experience with the church in the past. Maybe, man, you don't, you don't yet trust our church or whatever. Here's what I'd say. Take everything I'm about to say and apply it to some worthy nonprofit in our community. You don't have to give it here. Like Life Spring Pregnancy Center, the Salvation Army. Man, I, I could give you some recommendations. Okay, what, what I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to raise our giving. I'm trying to help us recognize our identity as stewards. And I'm trying to help us be prepared for the day that we're going to give an account. 
Okay, so one day, if, if this becomes your church, one day I hope you trust us and you'll give here because your generosity does fuel our ministry. But I'm so serious. Everything I'm about to say, if this bothers you, just take it and do it somewhere else, okay? We're doing fine. All right. If you're gonna take, if you're, if you're gonna grow as a steward, you have to know where you are and you have to know what your next step is, right? I mean, that's true of any area of discipleship. It's like, all right, where am I and what's the next step? Otherwise, it's just like overwhelming and crushing, never do anything. And so what I wanna do is I wanna try to help us kind of identify where we are and then take a next step. And we've got a diagram that I think is really helpful for this. So I think we're gonna put it up on, on the screen. Yeah. So we call this the generosity pathway. I think you've got it on the TVs. And it just lays out like different places that you might be in this process. And hear me, people are in very different places across this room when it comes to God's design for money. Um, some of you here and you've never given before, okay? You've, you've just never given before. I'm super grateful that you're here, right? At some point, everyone had never given before, right? Um, and if that's you, your first step is just to begin. I mean, your first step is to make your very first gift to the kingdom of God. That can be in our church, that can be somewhere else, but just to do something, right? Just to start the process of saying, I believe in this. Um, I get a little notifications every time somebody gives for the very first time to our church. I don't, it doesn't tell me how much money it is. It just says like, hey, this person gave, I don't know if it was $2 or $200,000. I genuinely don't. I get so excited when I see those emails because that just lets me know someone is trusting God with one of the most difficult areas of their life to trust God. Right, so if that's you, your next step is do something. You can give it here in the service, you can give it online, you can give it somewhere else, but may just go from not being on this pathway to beginning, all right? Now, others of us in this room, um, give, right? You've given before, you're like, that's not me, Josh, like I, I've given before. Maybe you give, gave to Deep and Why when we did the, that campaign or, or you know, maybe Hold the Rope or, or something else. Or maybe, um, th this is fun, and I was this for a long time, maybe you would, what I would call a church tipper, you know what church tipper is? It's like you come in, you're like, that was a pretty good sermon, what do I got in my pocket, you know? And you throw it in there. Hey, hear me. I'd much rather you tip me than not tip me, right? Like, uh, you ever been in food service? Like, everybody likes tippers, right? Um, but like, right, you, you're just, you're not real thoughtful about your giving. Like, you do give, but there's not really a plan. There's not a whole lot. It's just kind of like, what do I happen to have, right? All right, so you're in the beginning. I would say your next step is to become consistent. And what that means is, is prayerfully discern, all right, what, what percentage of my monthly income do I want to start devoting to the kingdom of God? That might be 3%. I don't know. It might be $25, $250, $2,500. I don't know what it is, but it's a plan. Intentionality communicates value. Let me give you an example. Um, my wife and I uh, have at least once a month, we've got four kids. It used to be a lot more than this. At least once a month, we go on a date, okay? And we plan it and we budget for it and the whole thing. And, you know, newsflash, when you have four kids, going on a date costs like $1,000 because you have to pay the babysitter $950, <laughs> So it's like, well, I guess we're going to McDonald's, you know, because that, you know, we, we pay the national debt to that 16-year-old or whatever. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, I, you know, imagine I told Meredith, hey, I love you, man. I value you so much. You're, man, you, you're so significant to me. I want to take you out on a date every month. And she'd probably feel pretty honored by that. But then what if I followed up and said, if I don't spend that money on something else? Would she feel very honored by that? <laughs> no, I'd be sleeping on the couch, you know, like, no, we, we communicate honor and value when we have an intentional plan about something. And so I'd say for you, if you're kind of in the beginning stage, you've been sort of tipping a little bit, I'm, great, I'm grateful for it, I truly am. But I would say, man, honor God by just having a plan, by saying, Lord, you're significant enough to me, I trust you enough that I wanna have some plan for my giving that is consistent. Man, you could set, we have a recurring giving that, that you can do online. That's what my family does. A lot of people here do because it's just a way to be consistent in giving. All right, so maybe that's you. Now, um, the next step from that, let's say you've been consistent in giving, the next step would probably be like tithing. Um, so tithing comes from the Hebrew word for a tenth, and it just means, man, I devote a tenth of my income to the work of God every month, okay? And we kind of see this modeled throughout the scriptures. Um, that would be a great space. If you've been in the consistent for a while, you're like, man, I've been given three or five percent, man, I want to I wanna get to a tithe, man, that would be awesome. Um, I, I know a family uh, in our church, this is a really cool story, that years ago, they were like five or six percent, and they said, hey, we decided by faith that we were going to go to 10 percent. We didn't really know how it was all going to work out, and they just had like three stories of this crazy supernatural provision, and I was like, I'm not making that stuff up, okay? Like, I didn't tell you to do this. God's just been faithful, so that might be the next step for you. Um, now, here's what I'd say. Uh, a lot of people that have grown up in church, maybe this is you, like maybe you've been tithing for a long time. Maybe you grew up in a family where it was just like, hey, if you make a dollar, you give a dime. You know, like you, you make $10, you give it out. So you've just always done this and not really thought that much about it. And here's what I'd say. If stewardship and giving was just about getting God off of your back, then the tithe would be the end. You'd be like, finally, I'm, I'm checking the box. I don't have to feel bad about this. Like God is off my back. But guys, stewardship is not about getting God off your back. Stewardship is about becoming a fully formed follower of Jesus Christ. And so just like you should wanna grow in, in as a husband, as a mother, 
as a student of God's word, as a disciple maker, as a worshiper, just like you'd want to grow in every other area of your discipleship, man, we should be striving to grow in the area of stewardship. So it's not like 10% is like you hit the ceiling and I'm done growing as a steward. It's like, no, you want to move from tithing to abundant giving. Abundant giving is like, man, how much can I give? How, how, can I give 12%? Can we increase 1% year over year? This is actually, in my, in my last church, my wife and I came in as tithers and left as abundant givers. Now, that was over six years, and that was over a lot of preaching and a lot of growth in my heart, but like that's, that's kind of our story now. Right? I don't say that to say like we're awesome. I just say that to say, like, man, that's a work that God's done in our life, and we've seen him provide for us. And so if you've been tithing for a long time, you don't even think about it, I think a challenge for you would be to consider, like, does God want to lead us into something else? Lead us further into this area of discipleship. Here's the last one, extravagant giver. All right, some of you have the spiritual gift of generosity listed in Romans chapter 12. Okay, just like preaching is a gift, just like hospitality is a gift. This is crazy. Think about this. Making money is a spiritual gift. It is. Some of you almost can't not make money. Like I've met you and I'm like, who are you? You know, like it's just like you've always got like side incomes and rental properties. And I'm like, who are you? You know, you were into Bitcoin before it was cool to be into Bitcoin, you know, that whole thing. Um, and let me just tell you, if, if that's you, Romans chapter 12 would say, man, use that gift. Develop that gift. Make as much money as you possibly can and invest as much money as you can into the kingdom. Like just be over the top generous with your money because God's gifted you in that way. And it's really cool, if you look throughout history, most of the great movements of God behind those great movements were some super generous business people who said, man, I know how to make money. I don't know how to preach, but I do know how to make money. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a bunch of it and I'm gonna give it to this ministry. In fact, the reason that we have an English Bible is because of a wealthy businessman. So quick story, William Tyndale translated the Bible out of Latin into English, very first person to do it. And I won't get into it, but the powers that be did not want that to happen. And so he was like on the run. And he had this friend that was a super successful businessman. He had this fleet of trading vessels and he was wealthy. So here's what he said. He said, William, I can't translate the Bible, but I can buy you a printing press. And so he put him up in his own house so he was safe. He, built, he bought a printing press so that Tyndale could translate all these Bibles in English. They could print them. And then this is great. And then he hid them in all of his trading vessels. And his trading vessels went out through all of Europe and English Bibles just started popping up everywhere across Europe. The reason that we have an English Bible today is in large part thanks to a really wealthy businessman who said, I'm going to make a bunch of money and I'm going to give a bunch of money for the kingdom of God. And so that might be you. So don't hear me saying like money is bad, stop it. I'd be like, use your money. Don't, be, don't let it be a refuge, but use your money for the kingdom of God. All right, if, if, if you're blessed by this church, I do hope that you'll give here. Like I hope, I'd be so thrilled if a bunch of you gave for the first time or set up recurring giving or increase your giving as a response to the sermon. But it doesn't have to be here. I truly genuinely mean that. Because my point in all of this is not try to increase our giving. It's try to help all of us be like, man, I'm a steward. And what do I do about that reality? How do I use my resources for God's glory? Um, but what, what I found as a pastor, and you probably have experienced this, um, is that when it comes to our resources, it's very difficult to, to trust God. Like maybe more so than anything else. Um, Martin Luther famously said there are three conversions in the Christian life. The conversion of the heart, of the mind, and of the purse. And he said the purse usually comes last. And I, I think we can probably all resonate with that, right? Like when your faith starts touching your checking account, it's, it's really starting to get real. Proverbs 27, 26 says that if we do money God's way, we can trust he will provide a lamb to give us clothing. That's what Proverbs 27, 26 says. But I mean, with all the uncertainty in our lives and all the uncertainty in our world, especially right now, man, how can we trust that God will do that? How can we trust if we do God, money God's way that we're gonna have what we need? Friends, you can trust God to provide a lamb to give you clothing because he has already provided you a lamb to give you righteousness. You can trust God to provide you a lamb to give you clothing, this small thing, because he's already provided a lamb to give you righteousness, which is a sweeping eternal thing. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God the son who took on flesh and hung on a cross to absorb all of the wrath of God against you and your sin. So that if you're in Christ, you don't have to fear the wrath of God. You'll stand before God and give an account for your life, but you don't have to worry. Am I gonna get in? Am I not gonna get in? Is God gonna pour his wrath out over me? He's not pouring his wrath out over you because he poured it out over Jesus. Here's what the gospel says, 2 Corinthians chapter eight. Though he was rich for our sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, we might become rich. Jesus Christ is the wealthiest being that there's ever been. 
And yet he laid down all of his wealth, all of his riches, all of his privilege in heaven. He came to earth. He became poor. He suffered and died naked and alone without a single possession to his name. Why? So that we could be saved and so that we could be given an eternal inheritance. And friends, any God who would do that for you is a God that you can trust. The ultimate place that we need to look if we want to trust God to provide for us is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So I just want to invite you to bow your heads with me. I know that this can be a really, really heavy topic, a really personal topic. And I just want to, I give you a couple questions to think through. Man, do you think of your life as, as belonging to you, as belonging to God? Is there not some next step that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to take? Is there some fear keeping you from obedience? I just want to give you a moment to pray and to hear from the Lord. And then our band will lead us to sing.